Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles with me for our scripture reading, for our sermon text this morning. We're going to be Romans 8, verse 32 today. Romans 8, verse 32. We are, of course, continuing our series, our firm foundation. Our firm foundation, the core truths of the Christian faith, of our Christian lives, and of our ministry here together as a church. This is the bedrock of who we are as Christians, what we believe, and how we serve the Lord. Romans chapter 8, where our focus will be on verse 32, but we're going to back up and read a little bit of context. I'm going to ask you to please stand. And we're going to read together God's holy word for us, his people. I'm going to begin in verse 28 and read to verse 32. This is God's word. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This is God's holy word for us, his people. Father, we ask that you would bless our time in this word. Send your Holy Spirit from heaven to do what only he can do, to take the reading and now especially the preaching of your holy word and make it come alive with power in our lives. Write your truth upon our hearts and send us from this place eager and with joy to obey all you've commanded us to believe and do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Most of you know that I am new to Pennsylvania. I took a vacation up here with my family a long time ago, and I had a college friend who got married in Pennsylvania, but that's it. So I'm, I'm brand new to Pennsylvania, and I'm still learning all about this area. One of the things I like to do when I'm driving is uh, I like to look at license plates. I love to look at out-of-state license plates. Um, and when I'm out of state, I like to look at in-state license plates. <laughs> so I've been seeing a lot of those, a lot of Pennsylvania plates, and I've been puzzled about this little object in the middle of Pennsylvania license plates. You know what I'm talking about? The little, whatever that little symbol is, whatever that thing is. I'm, 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 at a, I'm at a red light, and I'm looking at these plates. And I'm like, what is that little doodad? What, what do you call that? <laughs> Why is it there? And so I looked it up. And it is a keystone. Everybody already knew that. <laughs> now, me and the other southerner did not know that. <laughs> North Carolina and Georgia have no idea. So that's a little keystone or a capstone. And, uh, and then it turns out that Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State. Did you know that? Okay, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm learning every day about where we are. And apparently, yeah, Pennsylvania is the Keystone State. So that's why that symbol's there. And apparently, Pennsylvania held a crucial position among the 13 colonies in the Revolutionary War. Cool. I had no idea. Keystone State. And then I had another question. What's a keystone? <laughs> I've heard of keystones, capstones, but I, I wasn't really sure what it was, so I looked it up too. This is what I do in the office. <laughs> I get on Wikipedia and I learn about Pennsylvania. So I look it up, and here's what I learned about a keystone. I learned three things about keystones. A keystone is, just like the symbol on the license plate, it's a wedge-shaped stone at the apex of a masonry arch. So you got an arch, 
and the stones come up like this, and the arch is on the inside, and then the keystone is at the apex, right at the top of the arch. It's the final piece that's placed in the arch during construction. Okay? Why? Well, that's the second thing I learned. A keystone is wedged in at the top of the arch at the very end because that's the stone, that's the piece that locks all the other stones in place. Every other stone is built up on the sides and then across the top, and then there's a hole right in the middle at the top of the arch, and then you wedge that piece in, and it locks the whole structure in place. And the third thing I learned is that the keystone is what allows the arch to bear weight. The arch all by itself cannot be self-supporting until the keystone's in place. It would collapse without the keystone. But with the keystone firmly in place, all the other stones are able to stand and they're able to hold up under weight and stress that gets put upon the structure. Keystones. Now the last three weeks, we have been looking at Romans 8.30. And I've called that, as theologians do, the golden chain of redemption. And our series that we've been going through is all about our firm foundation. The foundation of the Christian faith and of our Christian lives. And in looking at the golden chain, we said that justification by faith alone is the cornerstone of the whole foundation. Remove that doctrine from the foundation, and the whole edifice of the Christian faith would collapse. Now this morning, I want to change the metaphor. Instead of imagining Romans 8.30 as a golden chain... Picture it as a golden arch, not McDonald's. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. One big golden arch. All four stones of that arch we now have in place because we've walked through, hello, <laughs> we've walked through Romans 8.30, and we've seen predestination. We've seen calling, justification, and glorification. All four of those stones are now in place, but what's the keystone? What doctrine sits at the apex of our golden arch? What doctrine keeps that arch from collapsing? And this morning, we answer this question. The keystone is the atonement, the atoning death of Jesus Christ. Justification is the cornerstone, and the keystone is the cross. The cross is what locks predestination and calling and justification and glorification. It's what locks them into position and allows them to bear the weight and stress of your sin, of the assaults of the devil of the temptations of the world and of the rebellion in our flesh. It's what allows that golden arch to stand under the weight and the stress. The golden arch is not self-supporting. Romans 8.30 does not stand all by itself. It can't. It needs the atonement at the apex of redemption, the climax of history, the summit of of God's sovereign and saving plan. It's what holds all things together, and it's what secures your eternal salvation. So this morning, our focus will be on verse 32. And as we look at verse 32, we're going to consider three sides or three dimensions of the atonement, three sides of this cross-shaped keystone. First, we're going to look at the essence of the atonement. Second, the extent of the atonement. And third, the effect of the atonement. And as we consider these things in the light of Scripture, we see that because of the atoning death of Jesus, because it is the keystone 
of the Christian faith, we must view every area of our lives in light of the cross. So let's begin. <clears throat> Number one, the essence of the atonement. <clears throat> what is the nature of the atonement? What is it and how does it work? Let me give you a brief description of what an atonement is, just in ordinary language. An atonement is what you do to make up for something you did wrong. If you do something wrong to someone, and then you try to make it right, that's an atonement. Making up for the bad things you've done. In other words, if you do the crime, you pay the time. And by paying the time, you're atoning for that crime you committed. And so, the second thing about an atonement is, it's not just what you do to make up for, that, for what you did wrong, but it also is something that, once you've done it, it absolves you from the guilt and penalty of wrongdoing. Once you make up for what you did wrong, you're free. Once a criminal serves his time, he's free to go. You don't throw him in jail for the same crime that he committed. Once he serves his time, he's done. You can't hold it against him any longer. He's free. He's absolved. He has atoned for his crime. And third, an atonement is intended to accomplish reconciliation. An atonement is all about reconciliation between you and the person that you've wronged. When you make up for the bad things you've done, the point is to get all that, get the air clear between you and the person that you had a relationship with that's now broken. It's all about reconnecting, reconciliation, restoring a broken relationship, healing the relational wounds that we cause when we sin against each other. So in just plain language, that's what an atonement is. And the Bible tells us very clearly that we are completely unable to atone for our own sins before God. Listen to Psalm 49, verses 7 to 9. The psalmist says, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. No one on this earth can pay the ransom price, can give an atonement for the sins of another person, and nor can you atone for your own sins before God. It, the cost is too high, Psalm 49 says. It's much too high. The sin is too deep. It's too bad. It's too long. We can't fully make up for our sins against God, so we need a Savior. We need Christ to atone for our sins. So our question is, how does he do that? How does Jesus atone for our wrongdoing, for our sin? How does he make it right with God? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up. Let's just stop right there. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up. Notice three things in this line about the essence of the atonement. What is it? How does it work? Three things. First, God is the one who provides the atonement. Notice the verbs. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up. Who's the he? That's God. God did not spare his own son, and God gave him up. God is the one who provides this atonement. He is sovereign over the cross. The death of Jesus was God's idea, not just Romans and Jews. It was God's plan. Acts 2.23 
Peter says to the unbelieving Jewish crowd, this Jesus delivered up, that's the same word in Greek as gave up in 832, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God delivered up Jesus according to his definite plan and his foreknowledge. God is the one who provides the atonement. Second, about the essence of the atonement. It's not just provided by God, but notice its nature. The atonement is penal. P-E-N-A-L, as in penalty. Penal. Jesus paid a legal penalty on the cross. And that's, that comes from this language of did not spare and gave him up. In Greek, spare is often used to mean exempt from punishment and injury. If you spare someone, if the court spares the guilty, the court exempts the guilty from undergoing the punishment he deserves. To spare means to exempt from punishment, and this verse says God did not do that for Jesus. He did not spare his own son. Jesus underwent the penalty. He was not exempt. He endured the legal punishment. And then gave him up. In Romans chapter 1, this language of giving someone up is the language of what it means to undergo the wrath of God. God gave up Jesus on the cross it's a word that's also in Greek, often it's used for delivering someone into custody, delivering someone over for judgment and for the penalty of death. God did not spare Jesus. He handed him over for legal, judicial sentencing. He gave him up means he gave Jesus the death sentence. The atonement is penal. Jesus paid a legal penalty. And then third, God provided the atonement. The atonement is a legal penalty for our sins. And then number three, the atonement is substitutionary. We all know what a substitution is. In basketball, somebody's playing poorly. Coach pulls them out, puts somebody else in. Substitution. We did the crime, but Jesus paid the time. We were in the game, sinning our soul away, and God pulls us out, <clears throat> and He subs in your Savior. He puts the Lord Jesus in your place. Notice this language. Verse 32, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for <clears throat> us. For us, in our behalf in Greek, in our place. It's substitutionary. And so when you put these together, this is where theologians get the theological term, the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. Now you've all been to seminary. <laughs> Penal substitutionary atonement. It's a mouthful, but all it means is Jesus paid our penalty in our place. That's it. Jesus paid our penalty in our place. He went to the cross and took upon himself what our sin, what your sin deserves. He atones for your wrongdoing. You did wrong. He didn't. And yet he's paying for it so you don't have to. Penal, substitutionary atonement. He is given for us. Given for us. Back earlier in the chapter, Romans 8, Paul says this, verse 2, for the 
verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, as a sin offering, He condemned sin in the flesh. God condemned sin in the flesh. Whose sin did He condemn? wasn't Jesus's. He didn't have any. It was your sin. Whose flesh did He condemn it in? Not yours. I don't see any nail marks on your hands. It's on Him. God condemned your sin in the flesh of His Son. That's the atonement. That's what it is. That's what it means. Or Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's a legal punishment. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Same language here as gave Him up for us. Christ did that. Or 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. He made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Penal substitutionary atonement. That's point one. What's the essence of the atonement? God provides the atonement for us and in our place. Second point this morning. The extent of the atonement. If what we just saw is the essence of the atonement, if, it, if that's what the atonement is and how it works, the next question we have to answer is, who is it for? Who is the atonement for? Who does the Father and the Son make this atonement for? What's the extent of the atonement? Well, look again at verse 32. Paul says, He did not spare His own Son, but He gave Him up for us all. For us all. All of us. Now, let me give you some advice when reading the Bible. Anytime in Scripture you see an all text, or an everyone text, or a world text, ask yourself this question, all of who? Everyone of who? Who's in view? If I send out a congregational email, if I just blast the congregation with an email and I say, hello, all. Do, am I including the Chinese? Right? Do I mean all people in the whole world, universally, no exceptions, every individual person who's ever lived? Do I mean that? All means all, right? All of who? Every one of who? That's a, that's a simple question. And then look in the context to see who he's talking about. So let's do that. Who's the all in this passage? And the answer is, the all is all of God's elect. All of God's elect. So let's just, let's do this experiment. Let's follow my own advice. Follow the we's and us's. Just look in the context and follow every time he says we or us, who's he talking about? Okay, verse 26. Let's just walk through it. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, so the us is the people that the Spirit is helping. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. How many unbelievers have the Holy Spirit interceding in their hearts so they can pray to God the way they're supposed to? 27. He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for 
the saints, according to the will of God. So us and we are the saints. And we know that for those who love God. Ah, there's the we. We're saints. We're those who love God. All things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so we're saints. We're, we love God. We're called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Do you see where we're going with this? Isn't it clear who he's talking about? To be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, so that we as the brothers of Jesus. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, we, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In the clincher, verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? So in the context, it couldn't be more clear who the atonement is intended for. God gave him up for us all means all of us who are God's people. All of us who are saints, called, predestined, justified. This is God's people. And so we call this in theology limited atonement. It's limited in its extent because it's only intended to atone for the sins of God's people. It's only meant to save God's elect. It's limited in its extent because it's for particular people. And so sometimes it's called particular redemption because it's for particular individual people whom God has chosen for His Son to save. Now this is probably the most controversial doctrine that the Reformed faith teaches. So let me give you some Bible. Okay, let me give you a few more verses. And there are plenty of these. I'm, I've just picked a couple to show you where else this is in Scripture. Matthew 121. The angel says to Joseph, speaking of Mary, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. His name means Savior of His people from their sins. That's why He's called Jesus, Savior of His people from their sins. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, Paul says, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Or later in the chapter, Ephesians 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. Christ gave himself up. Christ has a bride. Every man who's married in this room is commanded by God to love all people. Right? We should love our neighbor as ourselves. But it would be very wrong to conclude you should love all people the same way you love your spouse. If you loved all women the way you love your wife, there'd be big, big trouble. <laughs> and you'd be in my office. <laughs> right? Love all the women of the world. Love all the men of the world. Love all people. But then you have a special person. That is the treasure of your heart, your wife, your husband. Christ has a bride, and he came from heaven. He came and sought her to be his holy bride. And for her life, he died. Hebrews 9.15, Therefore, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised in eternal inheritance. Those who are called. 
Sounds like Romans. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. That's who it's for. It's to redeem his people. And then the last text I'll give you. There, there are tons of these. Last one. John chapter 10. Let's just get it right from Jesus' own mouth. You might say, yeah, 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 Paul. Paul thought that. Hebrews. Okay, where did Jesus teach this? Good question. John chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Jesus says, I, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. My flock knows me, and I know them, and I love them, and I lay down my life for my flock, for my sheep. Is every human being ever made one of the sheep of Christ? Is the whole world Christ's flock? No, and you know that because later in the same discourse, in verse 26, Jesus says this, You... Do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Now put it together. I lay down my life for the sheep, and you're not one of my sheep. Therefore, logically, he's not laying his life down for the non-sheep. Jesus couldn't be more clear. Who's the atonement for? It's for his people. And that's good news today because that means you have a perfect Savior who cannot fail you. Whose blood will never leave you stranded. Whose death could never take you most of the way and then let you fall a step before the finish line. You have been cast upon the arms of an almighty Savior who loves you supremely and who moved heaven and earth to make you His, who went to the cross and died under the penalty that your sin deserved when He did not have to do that. He was moved by love and He went to that tree. And where Adam disobeyed at a tree, Christ obeyed on the tree and undid Adam's sin and destroyed the works of the devil and ransomed for himself a people that he will never let go. And if you're his today, that's you, Christian. And because redemption is particular for God's elect, Jesus had all his people on his mind as he hung there and bought for them the redemption and the forgiveness of their sins. It's a perfect atonement. Otherwise, if Jesus died in the exact same way to save every human being on earth, His cross has been a miserable failure. Because how many people have died apart from Jesus in unbelief? Is Jesus a sometimes Savior? Is He a tried and tried and tried His very best but just couldn't pull it off Savior? Do you serve a Savior who sometimes, many times, fails? <clears throat> Will Jesus be unhappy for eternity because, man, I really tried to save everybody, but doggone it. Those stubborn, sovereign sinners. And he'll be frustrated forever. No, we do not serve that kind of Savior. We serve a powerful Jesus who always accomplishes the will of His Father. None of those that the Father gives to the Son will be lost. That's the extent of the atonement. And if we had time, there are plenty of verses that we could look at that have to be explained. There are other all verses, and you know, there's John 3, 16, and there are verses like that. And if we had time, we could look at those and see how, it, how all of Scripture is harmonious, how it all fits together. And if you want to talk later, be happy to do it. We could pursue this some other time. But there's what Scripture teaches positively on the extent of the atonement. So now, finally, point three. 
We've seen the essence of the atonement, a penal substitutionary atonement provided by God for us. Second, the extent of the atonement. It is a perfect sacrifice that perfectly saves forever all of God's elect people. And then finally, the effect of the atonement. What has the atonement accomplished? Again, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. That last half of the verse. How will he not also with Christ graciously give us all things? If God already gave us his most precious possession, his only son, there is nothing in this world that he is unwilling to give us. If he already gave us the best he had, his perfect, eternal, glorious son that he loves more than he could ever love anything else imaginable, you and me, the whole universe included, put us all on a scale, put every beautiful, lovely, good, attractive, valuable, precious thing imaginable on one side of the scale and put the Lord Jesus in his beauty and glory and perfection on the other side and his side tilts every time. Fairest Lord Jesus, we sang today. If he already gave us the purest and the best, there's nothing else he would not give us. And that's why Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for your good. God is working to give you your good. He gave you Christ, and he'll give you everything else besides. Christian, the golden arch... The golden chain, it was not cheap. It cost God everything. But because he was willing to make the payment, he also gained everything. The cross was not a failure. The cross accomplished everything, and it paid for everything. Every grace in that golden chain, that golden arch, was purchased for you at the cross. It's the keystone that locks it all into place. Every good, every blessing, every mercy in your life is a blood-bought gift. Everything you have was bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. This beautiful fall morning, the breath in your lungs, getting to see another day, getting to be here with friends, family, fellow believers to worship the Lord, to be alive in this world, to live for Him. Every good you have, every comfort and convenience, everything in this life is a blood-bought gift from Him. Psalm 84, 11, No good thing does He withhold from those who walk uprightly. It's all been purchased by the cross. And so you should look at everything in life through the lens of this keystone. You should look at everything in life through the lens of the cross. You should look at sin in light of the cross. You should look at God's law in light of the cross. You should look at forgiving one another when, they've, when you've wronged each other. You should look at it through the cross. Look at Jesus forgiving us and then think, how dare I hold a grudge against a fellow believer? You should view your marriage. You should view your relationship with your kids. You should look at everything through this lens. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. How could I be arrogant? How could I be proud? How could I hold a grudge? How could I refuse to forgive when such mercy was poured out for me? The cross should be the keystone of your life. Estimate and judge, Christian. Estimate and judge everything. Everything in this world on the basis of the cross. You see, it's only when the keystone is firmly in place in your life that your life will hold up 
under the weight and the stress of sin. Only when the keystone of the cross is in place in your life will you be able to endure to the end. And, O oh, Christian, if you do, you will be a monument to the saving power of your perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here in your presence. Thank you for being with us to open up the scriptures to us, to open our eyes to see it, to give us hearts to believe it, to convict us of its truth, to write its powerful living reality upon our hearts and our souls. May we stamp this truth upon our very eyeballs so that we see everything through the cross that we view ourselves and our relationships with others, that we view our gifts, the good things that happen in life, the sweet things you've given us, all the kindness we've received from you, all the mercy. May we just view it as a gift of the cross and may we worship you. May we do everything to the glory of our God. Whether we eat, whether we drink, whatever we do, may we do it to the glory of our God who gave us this Christ who gave us this cross, who has made us his, who bought us with his own blood, ransomed us from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation all throughout the world and through history, through all ages and from all nations. He is our Savior. We are his blood-bought, redeemed people. And oh, may we worship you today for the cross, for who you are, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done for us, for who you continue to be for us all that you've promised us, all the good you give us. May we worship you, and may we begin to work out all the places in our life that is inconsistent with our faith in you so that sin dissolves and we can run in obedience to you, rejoicing in your blood, which has bought us and secures us forever. May we be monuments to your power and glory, O oh God. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen.